Uh, welcome to the April meeting of the Plant-Based Nutrition Organization of Wisconsin. Uh, we have a lot uh, we have a lot to do today, so I'm going to talk as fast as I can here at the front end. The mission of our nonprofit group is to educate, inspire, and support each other on a an evidence-based, evidence-backed plant-based nutritional path for a health and improved quality of life. Our group is open to everyone, those plant-based and those just curious about it. And if you like more information about the group, you can go to our um, uh, website, pbnow.org, or our Facebook page and see um, upcoming events when they get posted. If, you, if you've already uh, registered, uh, you will get uh, regular uh, email uh, notices as, the, uh, as these events uh, are coming up. As we do each time, can I see a show of hands either by raising your hand or using the thumbs up icon uh, down on the bottom of the Zoom um, of how many of you are currently plant-based? I see those thumbs popping up and they, that's great, that's great. I'd say that's about a half right now. And some more here. As we mentioned at the beginning of each meeting, the evidence of the benefits of plant-based nutrition for people of all ages is published in non-biased medical research uh, is quite astounding. And we're gonna hear about more of that tonight uh, as we'll be hearing about more um, some of the recent research just the last uh, year or so. Uh, excuse me here for a minute, whoops. All right, Amberly, I'll get you up as co-host eventually here. Um, tonight, we're gonna hear from, you're gonna hear from three speakers. First, we'll hear from our PB Now Medical Director, Dr. Joshua Liberman. Uh, next, plant-based cooking instructor, Amberly Childs, is going to lead a short group discussion on our favorite plant-based rice dishes. And I'd encourage you to, uh, to share your favorites. And at about 6.20, uh, our featured speaker, Denver cardiologist, Dr. Andrew Freeman, will begin his talk and will be followed by questions and answers. Uh, most of you were muted when you first came in, and I'd ask uh, that anybody who's not, if you check and mute, just so that we don't hear any background noise and everybody can hear the speaker. Uh, as a reminder, we have meetings every month. They're usually on the second Thursday of the month at six o'clock. And of course, next month is not going to be on the second Thursday. It's going to be on the fourth Thursday, May 27th, when, among other things, we're going to, uh, we're going to have Dr. Mike, Michael Greger joining us uh, virtually for half an hour of uh, Q&A. You'll be able to find out more information about our upcoming meetings early next week on our website, Facebook page, or as I mentioned, if you've registered already, you'll receive an email. Uh, last, a quick technical note, as I mentioned, uh, I'd ask everybody to mute so everybody can hear the speakers as, um, as they're uh, speaking without interruption. Uh, and during the uh, question and answer and during the discussion, we'll be using the chat function down at the bottom of your middle of your screen where you can type in uh, your comments or questions, uh, hit enter and that way everybody can see it and we can, uh, we can discuss it. So, all right, here we go. Our, our first speaker tonight is a fellowship trained cardiologist practicing cardiology at Ascension Columbia St. Mary's here in Milwaukee. He is past president of the Wisconsin chapter of the American College of Cardiology and is also a member of the National American College of, College of Cardiology's Prevention Work Group. He is an advocate for the use of plant-based nutrition to help improve heart health, general health and quality of life and has seen the benefits of plant-based nutrition in both his personal life as well as that of his patients. We're fortunate to have him practicing here in Milwaukee and with us tonight. I'm happy to welcome our first speaker tonight, Dr. Joshua Liberman. Dr. Liberman. All right, thank you all. I uh, appreciate uh, everybody making time out of their, their schedules uh, after a year of doing Zoom meetings to just keep doing this. And it's wonderful to see so many people on board. Uh, tonight, it's, uh, you know, it's gonna be, uh, in, I, I think that they're all good, but tonight's really great. Uh, Andrew Freeman, I know him well. We've met a bunch of times at, uh, AC, at American College of Cardiology events and 
he's run a bunch of different committees and whatnot uh, that, that and one of which I sit on. So I'm really pleased that he's going to be uh, talking to us tonight. Um, usually I try to give a little bit of a, you know, um, a plant based tidbit or something like that. But but I actually I'm going to try to cut my comments a little bit short tonight just to give the others more time and definitely want to hear about Amberly and the, the, the rice based uh, plant based uh, uh, foods. Um, I, I guess what I wanted to do in, in my short little lot of time, though, is 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 to focus uh, not necessarily on, on, on something plant based in terms of nutrition, because we, we're going to spend a lot of time tonight talking about that with Andrew. Um, but I want to take a little bit of a moment just to to step back and, and, and you know, give us all a, a congratulations for making it through the last year. It's been really hard. It's been a struggle for a lot of us, some more so than others. Uh, some of us have, have lost loved ones, family members, uh, friends. Uh, it's been a hard year. And in the midst of this, um, it, it's hard to focus on nutrition. It's hard to focus on exercise. It's hard to focus on our health when we just feel like we're under siege in, in so many different ways. And um, one of the things we have coming up for the group, and, and I'm, I'm really excited about moving into the future, is, is, is focusing on some other aspects of self-care, focusing on other ways that we can take care of ourselves. So it's not just through nutrition, right? It's not just through exercise, uh, but, but something like mindfulness, I think is, is really important for, for our health moving forward. And there's, there, there's no way that you can be um, healthy simply by focusing on nutrition, right? If you're not doing any exercise, if you're smoking cigarettes, if you're, if you're not doing stress management, if you're not surrounded by a, a community of friends or, or you, know, uh, you know, if you don't have love in your, it's really hard to be truly healthy, right? You can't do it through nutrition alone. And, and even though this is the Plant-Based Nutrition Organization of Wisconsin, I think it's important that we, we give a little bit of time uh, to other things, to, to, to talk about exercise, to talk about ways you can exercise and, and you can get activity in your lives. And maybe that will do that in an upcoming uh, night. But uh, certainly we have, you know, uh, a couple months from now, I think we're going to maybe try to focus on, on some mindfulness and, and talk about what that can mean and, 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 and describe really more than, more than just a buzzword, like what it actually means to try to spend some time every day uh, to, to break away from the stress of our lives. And, and so I, I just want to put that little, that little seed in the ground. It's spring. We're, we're starting to plant some stuff pretty soon, hopefully. And so this is hopefully something that, that I want to put a seed in your minds and, and it's going to grow in, in a couple months. It'll blossom and we'll learn a lot more from a guest speaker about mindfulness. Um, so with that, I'm going to sign off and give uh, my time to Amber Lee and, uh, and Dr. Freeman. Carrie, you're, Sorry, you're on mute. <laughs> See, even, <laughs> even after a year of Zoom, we still do it. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Uh, so our, as uh, Dr. Liberman mentioned, our next, uh, our meeting after June, so our, our uh, May meeting, we'll have Dr. Gregor, our June meeting, uh, part of the meeting we're gonna be doing uh, some work on, or uh, talking about mindfulness and actually doing a, a few uh, small practices of that. And uh, the inspiration of, for the Plant-Based Nutrition Organization of Wisconsin largely came from the work of Dr. Ornish, who, who Dr. Liberman has talked about in the past. <clears throat> and in his program, he included those different uh, pieces that Dr. Liberman was talking about, the exercise, the connection uh, with our loved ones and friends, family, loved ones, uh, as well as the nutrition, which is a huge part of it. Um, and we will always have something about nutrition in the meeting and most of the meetings going forward, but we will, uh, especially during Everly's uh, discussion period. Um, but uh, it's, uh, there's no question that as Dr. Liberman mentioned, we, there's been a lot of stress and this is a perfect time to start talking about how we can relieve that in our, our own minds in a cheap way, an easy way um, and uh, a short way but a very effective way that's thousands of years uh, worth of, ex of effectiveness uh, to, to look back on. Yeah, if I could just, if I could just add something, I mean, we, we are finally coming out of this. I, I'm sure many of the people on this call have been vaccinated. Um, many, of, many of our community members have been vaccinated. We're doing really well. We're starting to see daylight, you know, and, and this is a perfect time to say, okay, 
I'm going to be able to get out there. I'm going to be able to, to, to do some activity. I'm going to be able to do stuff. This is a perfect time to set up new habits, right? Right now, starting to plan, moving forward, new habits of spending a little bit of time doing mindfulness every day, spending some time doing activities, spending some time, you know, preparing for, for meals, uh, you know, healthy plant-based meals. So, so this is a really good time to start thinking about moving forward. Uh, it's spring, it's rebirth, it's regrowth, and, and really excited about, you know, about the rest of the year, both for this program, uh, but also just for our health in general. Thanks, Josh. Uh, next, we're uh, going to we're going to have a short discussion on uh, favorite rice-based dishes, um, and our our speaker or moderator is um, is uh, well. Let me just say, it's a plant-based cooking instructor that uh, most of you know already, trained and certified in the food food for life program run by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Uh, there are a number of Food for Life instructors out there in the country, and, but uh, many people don't have the luxury of having one nearby. And we not only have one here in Milwaukee, but she is excellent. To lead our group discussion, here's plant-based cooking instructor, Amberly Childs. Amberly? Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Dr. Liberman. Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday. Nice to see you all. Um, I'm gonna switch my view here. All right. So nice to see you all. Thanks for making it into uh, to the meeting tonight. As Josh said, there's a million different things that we all can be doing, um, but taking time for yourself to learn more about your body, your, your energy, your food, and how it all kind of comes together, connects together is definitely a good use of your time. So thank you for being here. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about grains. Um, grains, unfortunately, get a bad rap um, in some of the food camps right? Um, but in, in this food camp, in the whole food plant-based world, grains are, grains are high on, on the food chain, um, and rightfully so. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple, a couple small reasons why they are rightfully so on the top of that food, food chain, food pyramid for me. Um, and then I'm going to talk about one of my favorite dishes. And then I want to encourage you to share with us a dish of yours that you like, um, maybe a favorite grain that you prepare regularly. Um, and there's two ways that you can do that. You can either... Um, um, comment in the chat box and I can comment for you. But what I would prefer you do is comment in the chat box that you've got a great dish um, and then I'll call on you and then you can turn um, your camera on or you can use your audio and you can tell us all about it. And then we're all just not sitting here staring at a screen. We're interacting with one another. So um, grains, why are they so good? Well, first of all, they are loaded with fiber. And fiber is the body's best friend. It removes toxins from our body. It removes excess cholesterol from our body. If you went on a walk or a run the other day and a bunch of trucks came by and just unloaded a whole bunch of pollutants in the air and you happen to breathe them in, um, the fiber that's in those grains, when it goes into your, your body and into your bowels and your system, it's going to bind onto those toxins and it's going to take them out with it. Um, and so there's so many amazing things that fiber does, but we unfortunately don't get enough fiber in our diet. We as people in the United States, um, typically, and it's just going to vary, obviously, based on region, based on your age, if you've already had an illness and you've already been told to eat more grains or whatnot. Um, but most people in the United States are getting probably between 10 and 20 grams of fiber a day. 20 being on the high side. Recommendations say that women should start around 32 and men should be around 40. So let's just say 40 is the number that we all should be aiming for because too much fiber is not really a bad thing because what happens is when we eat fiber, we're gonna get full. And so your belly will tell you, I'm done here. I don't need any more rice. I'm done. I don't need any more potatoes. Um, and so you're, when we have lots of fiber, our body will, will kind of draw the line there for us. So fiber has a wonderful benefits to our body. It does have some vitamins, some minerals. Um, there is a little bit of that, but the best thing about our grains is going to be that they are loaded with fiber and they're really, really economical on the pocketbook. Um, I buy my grains in big time bulk. I buy them in a 20 pound bag or sometimes a 50 pound bag, um, but I'm a chef. So I cook weekly, prepare food for everybody, but grains are so cheap and they can literally be down to the cents. I'm talking pennies if we buy them in big enough bulk. Um, if you have a place to store them, 
So look to your plant foods, specifically our grains to get that fiber because plant foods are the only place that fiber exists. Animal products, zero, big zero in the fiber. So grains are really gonna be that powerhouse. Um, I love the grains additionally because I can add them to anything. You can add them to a soup, you can add them to stews. I add them to curry. Maybe I have a leftover, I don't know, I had chili leftover the other day and I wanted to beef it up a little bit. So I was like, oh look, here's a little bit of leftover tomatoes, some cilantro, a little corn and some rice. And I just threw it in with the chili, added some hot sauce and I called it lunch. So grains really can be a nice addition to any meal and they're really gonna help fill us up um, because of that fiber. So now I got the nerdy stuff out of the way. Now I'm gonna tell you about one of my favorite grain dishes. Um, it is called um, birani. Uh, it's an Indian dish um, and birani is just a fancy name for rice with grain, or excuse me, rice with vegetables. Uh, and so birani sounds much nicer when I have friends over and I say, oh, would you like to come over for a sweet potato doll and a birani tonight versus I made some rice for us. Um, because once again, as I said, rice gets, you know, the grains and, and they kind of get, you know, poo pooed on a little bit and they don't get as much love as they should. So my favorite dish, um, obviously you can bake this, you can put it on the stove or you could, um, as I like to do it, cook it in the pressure cooker because if I use a basmati rice, cook it in my pressure cooker, I can have birani, which is vegetables and my grain of choice done in eight minutes. That's if I'm using a basmati rice if I go to a brown basmati rice, it's going to take a little bit longer, more in the 25 to 30 minute range because that brown rice needs a little bit longer to cook. But basically, I'm sauteing onions, garlic, and I could even take frozen vegetables, leftover vegetables, canned vegetables, put them in the bottom of my pot or my pressure cooker, stir them in with the garlic. Maybe you've got some extra ginger. You throw that in as well. You add in your water and you cook. And when you're done, you might have had, you know, cauliflower is one of my favorite to add in. Add a nut when you're done to give it a little bit of a, a crunch to it, maybe a raw cashew to go in there. So there's so many different ways that you could create a birani. Um, if you wanted to step your game up, you could start to add in some hot chili peppers, um, a whole level of spices like garam masala, cumin, cardamom. Um, but, you know, we all have our friend Google out there. Google. Birani, um, it is B-I-R-Y-A-N-I, Biryani. Um, and so that's one of my favorite dishes to do because I can change it every single time I do it. There's so much flexibility. You can change the grain, you can change the vegetables, um, and it literally will stay in the fridge for probably close to a week and you can just nibble on it for breakfast, lunch, dinner, um, or whatever. So that's one of my favorite grain dishes that I make all the time here at home. Like I said, I add a lot of variety to it, but now I want to open up our chat box and I'd love to hear from you. So I wanna hear about a grain that you like. Um, you know, is there a grain that you use? Like another grain that's really popular in my house is farro. My husband, the first time I ever made it, he said, this is like a nutty, warm, warm flavor and I really like it. Um, so I started using it more. So I want to hear from you and I want to hear what, what's something that happens in your family. So, oh, so Josh has given us, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Liberman has given us um, some more um, factoids and I love our facts. He says our ancestors probably ate um, greater than 100 grams of fiber in a day. In a day, can you imagine? Probably wasn't much colon cancer, I guess, going on um, back in those days either. All right, so Terry Lynch, Terry, um, do you want to chime in or do you want me to go? Uh, yeah, I'll chime in. And, and unfortunately, because, or I should say fortunately, because we have such a great uh, presentation coming up here, we only have about a minute left for the discussion. We'd like to make the discussion a bigger part uh, in the future of each one of the meetings so we can share what we like. Yeah, I, as, I'm, as I've mentioned before, I'm not much of a cook, so I go after things that are pre-made and uh, and I hope to get to that cooking a little bit more, but uh, beans and barley's black bean burritos are packed full of rice. Uh, and I'd like to get uh, I'd like to get more rice in the diet, but that's that's my go to as far as rice is concerned right now, along with uh, just rice and beans in a bowl. 
Well, it's great that way. Um, anybody else? Okay, so a nice veggie soup with barley is really good. Um, somebody else commented on barley and that's really exciting. Um, my biggest suggestion would be with grains is variety. Go to a store, I mean, right now you can still find a couple stores that serve in bulk and go and just check out the variety of grains. Just Google the variety of grains and look for them. And then, you know, the smaller the grain, the quicker it's going to cook. Um, somebody just wrote in there quinoa, exactly. Quinoa can cook in a couple minutes, which is pretty fantastic. The smaller the grain, similar to beans, the, the shorter time they're gonna take to cook. Um, and that can be really helpful when you're in the kitchen as well. Oh, there's some nice stuff coming up here. Yeah, so quinoa, somebody made a comment on quinoa and I'll just type in um, red quinoa holds, it, it's a little bit um, stronger, firmer of a grain. White quinoa breaks down a little bit and it gets a little bit softer. Um, so I tend to use like, I like white quinoa in stews and things because it kind of melts in and meshes in really well with a, a stew or a soup, <clears throat> excuse me. Red quinoa, however, is a little bit firmer and I like to use that in grain dishes because you can add a dressing to it and it'll still hold up without breaking down the integrity of it. Um, Rebecca's yeah, I, unfortunately, chiming. Unfortunately, We're ready. I've got to cut the, cut, yeah, cut the discussion off already. All right, um, well, you guys take a look in the chat box because there's some great suggestions there and then you don't have to hear from me. You can read it from yourself. So thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. And I'm really looking forward to Dr. Freeman's presentation. It's gonna be greater than anything I can add. So um, take it away, Terry. All right, thanks a lot, Amberly. Uh, so let's <clears throat> we'll go to our featured speaker tonight and uh, he is a summa cum laude graduate of Cornell University, a research honors graduate of the State University of New York at Buffalo School of Medicine and Biomedical Science. He did his residency at Brown University, Rhode Island Hospital in internal medicine, <clears throat> excuse me, and a fellowship at Temple University in cardiology. He is a cardiologist at National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado, where he's director of cardiovascular prevention and wellness and direct, <clears throat> Director of Clinical Cardiology and Operations. In addition to that, he's an Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Colorado, Denver. He is board certified in cardiovascular disease, internal medicine, echocardiography, echocardi nuclear cardiography, cardiovascular computed tomography, and advanced cardiac life support. He is also a founder and former co-chair of the American College of Cardiology's Nutrition and Lifestyle Work Group. Members of the work group include nationally known physicians such as Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, Dr. Neil Bernard, and our own Dr. Joshua Liberman. I'm pleased to welcome our featured speaker tonight, Dr. Andrew Freeman. Dr. Freeman? Well, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So you should see my slides, hopefully. Um, yes, and what a pleasure it is to be here. Uh, I think since I sent you that bio, I'm now an associate professor, if anyone cares. But uh, these little titles never seem to matter in any real way anyway. Um, and a, a big thanks to, to Josh Lieberman, of course, who, who invited uh, me initially and connected us. Um, and I just finished this talk, actually. So each year, for those of you who have not seen me talk, I comb through all the literature and I put together uh, all of the research that has gone on in the last year. Uh, so there's a lot of slides uh, and I'm gonna do it quickly, but there are references and I'll try to get the slides to Terry to distribute if people are interested. Uh, but what I wanna point out is that most of us and, and most of us in the physician world know nothing about nutrition and most of us don't follow the nutrition literature at all. And so we miss a lot of this stuff, which is sad. So I'm hoping that you guys will be inspired and uh, maybe check out some of my prior talks and you'll see reams and reams of data. So I also want to point out that it is truly impossible to, uh, hold on a second, here we go, truly impossible to do a nutrition study without imprisoning people and locking them up. So there's a lot of noise out there, but there's also a lot of signal and there's plenty of signal to make some firm conclusions on. I always love to show this slide because uh, when I started this uh, being plant-based uh, almost a decade ago, uh, and also brought it to the American College of Cardiology, I definitely stuck out. Uh, these days, it's a lot more mainstream than it ever was, so food for thought. 
And of course, the question I get all the time for everybody who ever asks it, there's plenty of protein in everything you eat. The world is made out of protein. Uh, and you really can't be protein deficient in the United States unless you're doing something really wacky. Uh, in all my years of treating, and I'm sure Josh will chime in, I've never treated protein deficiency in the United States. So it's really, it's hard to be protein deficient. I'd also point out that most of us used to think that smoking cigarettes was a smart idea. Uh, I think most of us, there are a few still who tell you that it's good for you, but most of us have decided that this is not the case. And so I always uh, hate when I hear that my colleagues are telling patients to eat red meat because they need iron or some nutrient that, that of course comes from the precursors, which are plants. And there's been some really alarming data. Uh, if you haven't seen uh, this, this is from the CDC, the obesity rate in 2018 was 42%, and it's actually gonna be uh, well over 50% in the next 10 years. Um, and among adults, the prevalence of obesity, severe obesity was the highest, of course, unfortunately, um, in non-Hispanic black adults. So there's a huge socioeconomic status divide uh, amongst obesity. Uh, here in Colorado, we're quote unquote the healthiest state, uh, but we have a huge divide between people who are uh, of white descent and those that are not. And uh, there's a very big, obesity epidemic in the uh, non-white Hispanics in our state. Um, so bottom line is we're in trouble. We need to do something. And it matters uh, early in life too. This was a, a, a small study in the Wall Street Journal that was published. A key to a healthier diet, of course, in the, as an adult, is to eat better as a baby. You know, and of course, we're feeding our babies, you know, chopped up hot dogs and Cheetos. Uh, you know, it, it's just a terrible thing. You know, they said there's a critical window between six and 12 months where our children are most receptive to new foods, including even bitter ones like greens and other things. Um, in fact, we actually are finding that this happens in mother's milk, even in utero, believe it or not. So we need to make some changes early, early, early in life. So encourage your kids or grandkids, if you have them, uh, to eat this way. And then when they start having babies, to continue eating this way. Um, and it said here, between 88 and 99% of children eat less than recommended amount of vegetables. Probably not, no surprise. About half of children ages four to eight are eating less than the recommended amount of fruit per day. And only 6% of babies six to 12 months old are eating dark green vegetables on any given day. I, I'm, I was surprised it was as high as 6%, believe it or not. I thought it was gonna be like 1%. But, um, and then I gotta try to move this little Sorry, a little technical thing on that. Sorry. Um, so we know that hypertension is, of course, the silent killer uh, in that, you know, when people have it, they don't know it and they end up with heart attacks and strokes. Uh, but it turns out it's a significant rise in the population. In fact, 2012, and particularly amongst the rural south where the stroke belt is, uh, we're seeing enormous rises in blood pressure. We also know that uh, the risk in African-Americans is not small. And there was a small study here done five weeks long. Just that's all it takes. 44 volunteers. Uh, committed to eating home delivery of non-dairy vegetarian meals, and they all had a significant uh, reduction in their cholesterol, blood pressure, and their overall risk. And actually, they adhere to the diet about 93% of the time. So I think there's a hunger, no pun intended, for eating healthier. It's just getting it to the people. Um, you want to lower your body mass index, your, your weight, uh, go vegetarian. This was a large study of about 9,000 people. And when you ate fewer animal products, no surprise, your body mass index was lower. Uh, we know that there's been lots of dietary wars over the years. This was a small study, 20 participants, uh, and they were either uh, assigned to a low-fat vegan diet or a low-carb diet, and then they switched. And basically, they found out that uh, 700 fewer daily calories were consumed on the plant-based diet, even though in both diets, everyone felt full. Um, and then only the low-fat diet actually resulted in significant reductions in body fat. Uh, how about kidney disease? So kidney disease is an enormous uh, problem in our country. And you may know this, but if you have friends or family on dialysis, roughly one in five of them will die each year or have a cardiovascular event each year um, from heart disease, which is pretty scary. So this was a study done in Tehran, um, a lipid and glucose study. They followed up 5,000 participants, and those who consume the most red and processed meat increased their risk for kidney disease by 73% and, of course, 99% uh, when compared to those who ate the least. And if they swapped out a serving, uh, they actually lowered their risk for the disease by 30%. And we know uh, from a lot of different studies that are now published in mainstream nephrology or kidney literature, that plant-based diets are surprisingly healthy for kidney disease. And for years, I've argued with my dialysis patients about eating healthier plant-based foods, 
you know, and they're always worried and rightly so around of phosphates and, and potassium, which they tend to hold on to. Uh, but my colleague, uh, Dr. Joshi, some of you may know or see him speak, really uh, smart nephrologist is finally getting some good publications in this space. And what they said here is that issues that may have not been as, as significant as previously thought, there's uh, significant advantages. And the risk uh, uh, to benefit ratio of plant-based diets is tilting in favor of their use in kidney disease patients. Uh, there's another study here, plant-based diets to manage uh, the complications of kidney disease. Um, and they said that they have the lowest net endogenous acid load, which of course is helpful in kidney disease. Plant phosphorus is actually bound in a way that makes it less bioavailable, so it's not absorbed. Um, and then we know that restrictions of plant foods as a strategy to prevent high potassium deprives patients of all the benefits. So it's not surprising sometimes to see my kidney disease patients eating large amounts of protein uh, in the form of steak and other things because that's what their kidney doctors told them. So really wrong. And then uh, interestingly, uh, for those of you that are not on a low oil diet, this was a study where they replaced five grams of margarine, butter, or mayonnaise with the same amount of olive oil and actually lowered the risk of coronary disease. And for those of you that do know my friend Esselstyn, you know, he'd tell you that oil is absolutely a no-no. I would tell you that in certain populations, a small amount of oil is probably not a bad thing. But if you're at risk for heart disease, you may want to significantly avoid it. And remember, olive oil is the only oil really where you can just squeeze the oil out of the olive, right? There's no high pressure, steam pressure things that are required. But anyway, in this study, of a, a huge population from the Nurses Health Study, uh, they showed that um, in, in general, a marked lower risk of coronary disease. Um, and, it, and it didn't show any significant association when they used all the other oils. So olive oil is the go-to oil if you use oil. We know uh, that getting rid of red meat is always a plus, but in this particular study of 37,000 Americans, uh, those who ate the most plant uh, protein were 27% less likely to die of any cause, 29% less likely to die of heart disease. And if you replace just 5% of calories from, uh, with, uh, from animal protein with an equal amount of plant protein, you have 50% decreased risk of dying from any cause. There is no pill on the planet that I can give any of you that will get that kind of goal. And then if you replace 2% of processed meat, you get 32% less death. Just 2%, it's pretty amazing. Have a strokes, this is an interesting study this last year, about 60,000 women, uh, estimated 26 uh, year risks with no lifestyle interventions were about 4.7% for total stroke. Uh, with exercise, not smoking and weight loss, the risk went down. Uh, and uh, in fact, lifestyle modifications were estimated to reduce the risk of stroke over 26 years uh, by 25% overall and ischemic stroke by 36%, which is a, a form of stroke uh, due to blood vessel disease. Um, and so sustained dietary modifications were estimated to reduce the uh, risk of stroke by about a quarter as well. So really powerful way to reduce stroke, which is a major life altering disease. So this is an interesting study. As you may know, the British Medical Journal is a very powerful journal overseas. Uh, they've been focusing a lot, uh, as has the Lancet recently, on why plant-based diets are, are really powerful. And the key messages here were obesity and alcohol increase the risk of several types of cancer. Uh, for colorectal cancer, processed meat increases risk and red meat probably increases risk. Fiber and all that probably reduce risk. Foods containing mutagens, which are often animal products, also increase cancer. Fruits and vegetables are not linked to cancer, no surprise, uh, although very low intakes might increase their risk. Uh, and then other nutritional factors seem to contribute. And remember that after heart disease, the number two risk is cancer. How about diabetes? So there were 28 articles studied in this uh, uh, series here, uh, and they looked at the relationship between meat consumption and diabetes, and those who consume the most total meat, red meat, and processed meat increased the risk for diabetes by up to a third. An extra 100 grams per day, which is not very much, of total meat or red meat increased the risk by 36%. 50 grams of processed meat per day increased the risk for diabetes by 46%. So I always am shocked when I see my diabetic patients eating a portion of bacon in the morning, uh, and they are only making themselves worse and, and with the eggs on top of that. Eggs are known very much uh, to associate with the risk of diabetes. This is another study here, about 10,000 participants and, an, uh, and another 14,000 individuals. And those who ate the most fruit or vegetables reduced the risk for diabetes by up to half. 66 grams per day of more fruits and vegetables were associated with a 25% lower risk of diabetes. So again, a lot of my diabetics are afraid to eat fruit because they think the sugars are gonna kill them. And the truth is it's all the other stuff that's already there. And then as I mentioned before, and I've talked many, many times over the years about this, but eggs and diabetes are, are very much associated with each other. 
This is a study that compared egg consumption with blood glucose levels in 8,500 participants. Just one or more eggs per day increases the risk of diabetes by 30% or more. So stay away from eggs. I know they taste good, but they are not good for you unless you have no other source of protein and then you have to do what you gotta do. Um, how about cooked meat and chronic disease? So I've talked about this before. When we cook our meat, uh, it creates all sorts of bad compounds, including heterosexual amines and others. So researchers compared a diet high in red and processed meat with a diet high in whole grains, nuts, and legumes in 51 participants, and they tracked the levels of these glyc uh, glycation or glyco glycogen end products, which you get from grilling everything. And those who ate the red and processed meat increased their concentrations of these awful things, uh, which is uh, uh, are associated with disease progression. A lot of people don't seem to understand why disease is on the rise, and I think a lot of it has to do with all the meats that we eat regularly and how we cook them. And then for diabetes, remember that carbs are not the enemy. It's typically the fat that's the enemy, but you would have to eat good carbs. So in the Nurses Health Study, uh, they, they looked at this enormous population. They followed uh, people for 4.7 person years of follow-up. And those who ate the most whole grains, including whole grain breakfast cereal, oatmeal, dark bread, brown rice, had a uh, third reduction in diabetes compared to those who ate the lowest. So eat the good stuff like you heard. Uh, grains can be your friend. Um, and if you like a biryani, uh, what a great way to go. Now, those of you who have heard me speak before about sodas, there is no soda that is good for you. There is no soda that is good for your diet or regular. Um, you know, you might be able to get away with seltzer if you really want it, but even too much of that can actually be harmful. Uh, but in this particular study, sugar-sweetened beverages had 20% more cardiovascular risk, artificially sweetened beverages, 32% more risk. So in general, you really want to stay away from them altogether. So those of you addicted to Diet Coke, break the habit. There's a lot of people out there that drink the stuff like it's going out of style. Um, and you can see here that uh, in the various uh, studies here that no matter where you were in general, you ended up with more risk unless you were a non-consumer, at which point you were in the neutral part of this chart here, which is that you got on the dotted line. Don't forget that the much maligned potato is actually our friend. Uh, this was a study of a small study, 24 participants with diabetes. They ate uh, one of four experimental dinners uh, that included potatoes prepared multiple ways versus a dinner with basmati rice. Blood sugar was checked before, after, and at 30 minute intervals, no difference in glucose responses between meals. The overnight glucose response was more controlled after a potato dinner than the rice meal, believe it or not. How about gestational diabetes? Uh, this is on the rise, as you may know, and then it leads to diabetes in many women after they give birth. Um, in the Nurses Health Study, they followed these folks. Dietary intake was scored. The analysis showed a strong inverse association between a plant-based diet and gestational diabetes with 30% reduced risk. The researchers also identified a 13% lower risk of gestational diabetes for every 10-point increment they boosted on their uh, plant-based diet index, which is a survey of foods they answered. How about cinnamon? Who doesn't like it? Uh, it's in a lot of really great dishes. This is a small study, 52 people. Uh, 27 people ate 500 milligrams a day of cinnamon. Those who took the cinnamon supplement uh, in this way had more stable blood sugar levels. Also, modest drops in hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of blood sugar. Always good to have less dying. So this was a good study uh, from the U.S. National Institutes of Health, uh, AARP diet cohort, and replacing just 3% of animal protein with plant-based protein uh, from foods such as bread, cereal, pasta, et cetera, reduced the risk of death from heart disease by 12%, overall death, death risk by 10%, and the associations were strongest when it came to replacing eggs and red meat with up to a 24% less risk of dying. I mean, these numbers are just incredibly uh, incredible. Uh, another uh, study here, 32 per, uh, prospective cohort studies were included. Higher intake of total protein was associated with a 6% lower risk of all-cause mortality, uh, but higher intake of plant protein was significantly associated with an 8% lower risk of all-cause mortality and 22% less cardiovascular disease mortality. So having some protein in your diet is a plus, but having plant protein in your diet is absolutely the preferred source. And it's always about inflammation. Those of you who have heard me speak before, all diseases share the same common endpoint, which is inflammation. And if we can cut the inflammation, we typically can get diseases under control. In this study, diets with the most inflammatory foods, such as red and processed meat, had marked increases for coronary disease, heart attack, stroke, etc. But when you followed a diet with more anti-inflammatory foods, they did way better. We also know that Fighting COVID uh, may be a, a major uh, topic if you haven't heard this. So first, 
being obese is majorly uh, a risk factor for contracting and doing poorly with COVID. And then it appears that when we eat better and we stay slimmer, we're more resilient and resistant to it. Um, and so, as I mentioned, obesity is linked to diabetes, heart disease, and cancer, and considered a key risk factor for COVID-19. Believe it or not, in some states, maybe your state, if you're obese, you get to cut the line to get the vaccine, uh, which is kind of unbelievable to think about. Um, it was also discussed in the BMJ collection, our food systems are making us ill. The COVID-19 outbreaks at, at meat packing plants, especially here in Colorado, believe it or not, have focused minds on the meat industry as a driver for acute and chronic disease, both amongst its workers and then how the conditions are. Uh, last month, uh, colleagues wrote that the food industry should be held accountable. Uh, and then the WHO, you may have seen, has released a report. We really just need to stay away from uh, meat processing in general. As I mentioned before, you saw the hypertension uh, study. This was another study that came out of the Intermap study about uh, 5,000 men and women. If you followed a healthy plant-based diet index, your blood pressure dropped. But if you followed an unhealthy plant diet index, uh, so remember there, there are two types of eaters on the planet who follow a plant-based diet, those who eat sort of the vegan junk food and those who eat like peasants. I want you to eat like a peasant instead of the vegan junk food. These days, there is no shortage of uh, foods that you can find that replace all of our animal product favorites. Cheeses and meats and cookies and pastries and all these things. There's a plant-based version of everything. Those should be really special treats. They should be rare. And so when you follow it, and this is, a, there's been other studies that have showed last year that if you follow an unhealthy plant-based index, you actually do worse than the carnivores. So be careful. How about asthma? Uh, so I've talked about asthma before. Asthma is a very big inflammatory condition. And asthma cases actually have risen over the last five years uh, or more because of a high fat westernized diet. But when you eat a diet that is anti-inflammatory high in fruits and vegetables, it actually lowers the risk for asthma. And I've talked about this before, but dairy is a major uh, inflamer and should be stay, uh, should people who have asthma should stay away. And there's been very large studies over the years that have shown. The good thing is coffee is still coming out positive. So for those of you including me who drink coffee regularly, uh, in this study here, um, uh, this, these were people who were followed for about five years. Uh, in general, um, compared with not drinking coffee, having five cups a day actually lowered the risk for many arrhythmias. So for those of you that are afraid of arrhythmias, if you drink coffee habitually, and I will point that out, if you drink coffee once in a while and you have five cups, you're really going to notice it. But if you drink coffee regularly, um, it doesn't seem to have a big impact on blood pressure or arrhythmia. And every additional cup lowered the risk by 3%. I don't know about you, if I start drinking five cups of coffee, I am definitely jittery and peeing a lot. Uh, so I don't know how people do it, but there are people out there that do. Um, this is another interesting study here. This is a Japanese cohort of about 5,000 patients followed for five years. Uh, drinking a cup of green tea every day lowered uh, mortality risk by 15%, two to three cups, 27%, four cups associated with a 40% drop. But if you had coffee, one cup a day was associated with a 12% lower risk of mortality two cups with a 41% reduction. And then if a 51% lower risk of death for two to three cups of green tea and two cups of coffee, and up to a 63% lower death for four cups of green tea and two cups of coffee per day. So I was always joking with my colleagues, these are amazing studies, but you spend all day drinking coffee and tea, you might not have a job, maybe you're retired or, or you have all this free time, so maybe life is easy, I don't know. But nonetheless, sip on coffee and tea throughout the day if you're up for it. And also less cancer, believe it or not. So people who have drank up to nine cups of coffee per day had a 9% lower risk for developing prostate cancer. Um, so you want to drink these flavanols. These are all the antioxidants in lots of uh, uh, coffees and teas and berries and chocolates. Uh, in this study, the difference in blood pressure between participants at the lowest intake of flavanols and the highest was about four millimeters of mercury. Uh, and this is comparable to meaningful changes in blood pressure observed with those following the DASH diet. So remember, flavanols come from antioxidants, uh, antioxidant-rich foods like berries, teas, and of course, uh, cacao powder, not Hershey Kisses. And then we also saw another study uh, with berries here. This the uh, people were followed for about 20 years from the Framingham study, uh, Framingham study offspring cohort. Uh, and those who have the highest flavonoid intake from berries, fruits, and other plant-based foods were 40% less likely to develop dementia. So make sure to get those berries in every day if you can. Fresh or frozen, it doesn't matter. And then for those of you that are familiar with the DASH diet, it's a predominantly plant-based diet with a little bit of dairy. Uh, these people were followed for a while, and here, uh, mean age of participants was 45. 
Um, and they had eight weeks of monitor feeding with a control diet of what Americans eat, then a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, uh, or the DASH diet, and then compared with the control diet, the fruit and vegetable diet reduced troponin levels, which is a marker of heart disease, heart damage. Uh, and then compared with the control diet, the DASH diet reduced it uh, also. Uh, none of the markers differ between the fruit and vegetable and DASH diet. So bottom line is the DASH diet, which is a predominantly plant-based diet and a fruit and vegetable rich diet, are fantastic and they seem to be much better than the typical American diet. How about sushi? So I always recommend going out for veggie sushi. Uh, in most places these days, you can find the most delicious and decadent and creative uh, sushi dishes that everyone wants to try more than the fish. But believe it or not, fish used in sushi and other marine life contain 283 times more parasites. Who doesn't like a little parasite with their sushi? Uh, may increase the risk for uh, a very bizarre condition called Uh So make it the veggie sushi instead. How about soy and tofu and heart disease? So this is again a very large study, again from the nurses' health study. Isoflavones from so uh, soy was uh, inversely associated with heart disease. Uh, and comparing the extreme quintiles from the most to the least, uh, those who had the uh, most uh, actually had 13% uh, less heart disease. Consumption of tofu in this study, but not soy milk, was uh, inversely associated with the, with the risk of heart disease with a pooled hazard ratio that uh, showed an 18% risk reduction in heart disease. So get those isoflavones and eat some tofu. Uh, try to get organic whenever possible. How about soy and dementia? Uh, so this was another uh, interesting study. There's a metabolite produced in the gut uh, from consuming soy called equal, and it seems to reduce the risk for dementia. Please note this is not equal. This is not the artificial sweetener. Uh, brain MRIs in 91 elderly participants correlating with certain equal levels, and those who produced the most of this uh, substance from dietary soy had 50% uh, less lesions in their brain. So there's something to this. Uh, this was a really interesting study that uh, thankfully I got to work on with my colleagues here. Um, and you can see that a lot of these people are people that you know well. Uh, and we talked a lot about addressing disparities in diet-related cardiovascular disease. And the authors in this case, uh, and one of the authors call on public health policy to change uh, and address the disparities to reduce poor health outcomes in underserved populations, increasing access to healthful foods, and disincentivizing low-quality food purchases through revisions to the nutrition assistance programs. Remember, soda remember, is one of the highest things purchased on the food stamps. Um, eat well to protect again from heart disease. This is another big study. Uh, healthful and unhealthful plant dietary indices were followed. And in general, those with a higher healthful plant-based pattern were significantly protected against heart disease. And the case in the case of women was a much stronger association, 32% less. So eat this way. Cruciferous vegetables are favorites in this study of Western Australian women. Uh, women in the study who consume more than 45 grams of crucif cruciferous vegetables, which is not much, by the way, that's a quarter a cup of steamed broccoli. I had 46% less aortic calcification. So again, the study strengthens the hypothesis that cruciferous vegetables seem to protect against vascular calcification, which is a marker for atherosclerosis. Um, this was an interesting study called the swap meat, and they, uh, they took a single site randomized crossover trial. Participants were instructed to consume greater than two servings a day of plant-based meats compared with animal meats for eight weeks each. And there was a significant drop in LDL weight and TMAO, transmethylamine oxide, which is that bad stuff our gut produces when we eat meat regularly. So there is some benefit. If you're going to eat some form of plant-based uh, meat instead of red meat, fine. But I would really limit it. Remember that these things are very, very, very high in fat. Um, how about breast cancer? So you, those of you who have seen me talk before, I talk a lot about this over the years. Uh, 19 study analysis, those who consume the most fiber and an 8% reduced risk for premenopausal and postmenopausal cancers. Soluble fiber from cereals, fruit, legumes, and vegetables show the strongest association with the reduced risk. Uh, so again, make sure you get that fiber and stay, try to stay away from fiber supplements. Eat the fiber in the form of the fruit or the vegetable. Many of you may not know this, but when you eat these fiber-enriched foods, a lot of it comes from a fiber called inulin, which comes from chicory roots. So it's sort of like wood chips being ground up and added to your food. If that's what you're into, feel free, but better to eat the fruits and vegetables if you can. How about dairy and breast cancer? Big associations over the years. Um, no associations were found between soy products independent of dairy, but higher intake was up to a 50% higher risk of breast cancer. Uh, full fat and reduced fat milks also showed the same results. Substitute uh, median intakes of dairy milk by those for soy milk 
and you get a 32% drop. So think about this. Everyone's worried about soy, and here we are drinking dairy and cheese and all that. Do remember, though, by the way, the most potent of all plant-based estrogen is actually beer. And you guys live in a beer state, uh, so you can laugh at all the people who won't eat soy uh, and will drink a beer about it. So I have a prostate cancer. 1919 cases of prostate cancer in subjects that were younger, set under 75. Those who had the healthiest diet, of course, had less cancer risk. Those who had the healthiest diets also had less high-grade prostate cancer. So eat this way to protect yourself. Um, so this is the American Cancer Society, and they actually recommended and endorsed a plant, uh, plant-based foods, excluding or limiting red and processed foods, in addition to highlighting physical activity and maintaining a healthy weight. Recommendations focus on eating nutrient-dense fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains. Uh, as you may know, Costco is reopening its food courts, and you can get that $1.50 hot dog and a soda, and I can promise you that that will cost you hundreds and thousands of dollars, more than $1.50, but it may not happen for many years. There's a little bit of a latency. So if you eat a hot dog today, you may not get cancer tomorrow, but you might in 25 years, and I can trust you. I Trust me, that will cost you a lot more than $1.50. How about testosterone? Um, men do not need to consume meat to maintain normal testosterone levels. So for all of you that have been called uh, girlish or weak or non-manly because you were not eating meat uh, with the boys, you can tell them they're wrong. How about when we age gracefully? This was an interesting study. Uh, Plant-based diets reduce the risk of non-communicable chronic diseases, diabetes, cancer, heart disease by 50%. Uh, they could cut cardiometabolic related deaths by half. Diets uh, rich in these uh, same foods also re reduce the risk of cognitive diseases and also improve longevity as evidenced by Blue Zones. Think about this. In this country, we all work hard. We save our money when it's ready to retire. Uh, when we're ready to retire, what do we look forward to? Heart disease, erectile dysfunction, carotid disease, dementia. These sound like really great ways to retire. So we need to change what we do to age gracefully. British Medical Journal again. Uh, this was an interesting study here between nutritional uh, profile foods. Um, oops. I think, oh, here it is. This is the same study here. So this was 521,324 uh, adults at recruitment. Um, and they followed the score and those with the better score when they were eating better. Uh, sorry, those with the higher score when they were eating worse. And an increased risk of all-cause mortality, mortality from cancer, heart disease, respiratory disease, and digestive diseases. And again, this was a big study looking uh, predominantly at certain types of foods uh, that were considered to have a, a lower Nutri-Score, score that was uh, suggested the foods were unhealthy. Uh, this was another study from the Annals of Internal Medicine, which is a very big journal in the United States. Uh, and this caused an enormous controversy. Uh, they basically suggested that, uh, that we continue to, uh, to consume unprocessed red meat uh, because, uh, and they called it a weak recommendation with low certainty evidence, I would tell you, they had no evidence. If you read this paper, uh, which was on every media outlet in, in the country, you would see that uh, there was a huge discrepancy in this recommendation and what they found, which basically it causes harm. But their suggestion was because the harm was relatively small, we should just keep doing what they're doing. Uh, it was a, a crazy thing. And then there was another study that came out from this uh, same group of people here, Arnie Ashcroft and others. Uh, and it said here that uh, foods with a complex matrix that are not associated with the increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, the total totality of available evidence does not support limiting these foods. And I would tell you, saturated fat from animal products absolutely does uh, link to heart disease. Uh, this was a very uh, misconstrued uh, paper and data study. So uh, there was some outcries there. This was a really good one from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. It said recent publications about red and processed meat suggest that we, as a nutrition science community, have a long way to go to ensure the trust of the scientific community and the clinicians and the public. The stakes are high. We have a responsibility and duty to conduct high quality science, properly interpret the data, and the recent reports in red and processed meat fell short on several of these points. Uh, even better, uh, you may have seen David Katz, who's from Yale. He had an editorial, Vegetarian Dietary Patterns and the Prevention and Treatment of Disease. And the assembly of papers collected here highlights direct health benefits of a well-practiced vegetarianism at this time, uh, when the indirect benefits via effects on aquifers, ecosystems, fires, floods, and droughts may be even more salient. And I don't know about you, I know I'm in the middle of the country as you, uh, you guys, but we have seen incredible weather extremes, and this is happening all over the world, and our water supplies are changing very rapidly, and there's something that, to be said by what humans are doing on the planet. 
Um, this was a, uh, a study that came out of uh, Circulation, which is the American Heart Association Journal. Um, and what they showed here uh, was that uh, their national model suggests that full implementation of a U.S. calorie menu labeling law would generate significant health gains in healthcare. Industry responses to reformulate menu, menu items would provide even larger additional benefits. So what they're asking for is for the U.S. to label what's in their foods at all times at every place you go, and then also uh, indicate their health benefits. And you can imagine that many people would very rapidly change what they put on the menu when people knew in full disclosure what was in things. Okay, so that may be fine, but are we satisfied when we eat this way? So this was a very interesting study um, where they compared, compared brain activity and satiety in 20 type 2 diabetic patients. And when they consumed a meal with meat, uh, they had a decrease of uh, hormone that affects the reward circuit in the brain. When they consumed the plant-based meal, they were more satisfied and had better blood flow in the regions of the brain associated with food intake and satiety. How about stress? Well, a lot of people underestimate uh, stress and the mind state associated with it. 24 ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, patients with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, these are people who have weak hearts. They completed a daily assessment of perceived stress, anger, and negative emotion. And 14 patients experienced stress-induced increases in an echo parameter, uh, suggesting that their heart actually got less stiff when they were uh, doing a mindfulness approach. So it's important that it, it, it is very important to incorporate a mindfulness approach every day along with your diets. Um, and knowledge really is power. This is a really interesting study. Researchers divided students in, uh, in the university setting. One got one 50-minute lecture on how dietary choices affect climate change and health benefits of eating less meat. And another control group got a lecture on a placebo topic. And then 49,000 students' meal purchases were analyzed. And the researchers tracked this. And they found that those in the intervention group were about 5% less likely to purchase a meat-based meal and 4% uh, more likely to purchase a plant-based meal. And meat meal sales decline throughout the year. So knowledge is power. And I think we all need to leave here with this power to change the world, so to speak. How about erectile dysfunction? Greater than 20,000 men participating in a long-term study here, 22% decrease in the risk of the ED in those who consume the healthiest diet, in this case, a Mediterranean diet, which is a predominant this is another study here of million plus years of follow-up. One serving a day of combined plant protein sources, nuts, legumes, and soy, lowered heart disease risk by 14%. And then how about fries here? This was an interesting study that if you ate more fried food, you had a 28% greater risk of major cardiovascular events, even fried vegetarian food like potatoes, uh, and more heart failure. So do your best to cut these risks if you can. Um, each risk uh, would go up significantly with just four ounces uh, which is not very much at all. Uh, this was another interesting uh, trial, 16 weeks, uh, 244 participants. The intervention group was asked to follow a low-fat vegan diet, uh, and body weight went down significantly, six kilograms, which is about you know almost 15 pounds. Liver fat and muscle fat dropped significantly as well. Don't forget to exercise, right? So if you eat well and you sit on the couch only, you're also going to have a problem. This study showed that just 11 minutes a day um, actually had a much less likelihood of dying. Uh, even if they sat for eight to 10 hours. Uh, so see what you can do, but in general, 30, 40 minutes uh, per day uh, will significantly lower the risk of death from being sedentary. Remember uh, also that in this particular uh, study, uh, when we get moving more, people do better. So participants reported the frequency of structured exercise and completed a, a VO2 max test uh, on, a, on a cycle, a bicycle. And those exercising one to two times a week or greater than three times a week uh, had a significant lower odds of reporting depression and anxiety, so up to about a quarter percent reduction uh, for people who exercise. And these days, and particularly during the pandemic, I always encourage people to exercise uh, to improve their mind state and reduce depression. And then this was an interesting study that showed that overall, that even if you're quote unquote fit and fat, there's really not a great uh, study that suggests that that's a good combination. Um, so they said here that although physical activity mitigates the detrimental effects of being overweight or obese, excess body weight is still associated with a, remark, a remarkable increase in major risk factors. So get thinner and fitter. Um, this was an interesting thing here. Oops. Uh, this was from a whistleblower. So this was in Wired magazine, which is not a typical vegan magazine, uh, but they showed all the technology that this guy used to expose a pig farm in Iowa. And it was, a, and it was very interesting. 
uh, that they show that large clusters of livestock are killed at once by turning off airflow in a closed barn, pumping in heat. So they suffocated all these animals and this guy caught it. So if you're interested, take a look at Wired Magazine, which again is not a vegan magazine, you'll be blown away. Um, and then here's an interesting study that came out this year, getting a hot tub, if you're diabetic in particular, uh, it showed here that you were much less likely um, to have a, a problem. In fact, you can see that you would actually uh, have a lower uh, body weight and waist circumference and maybe even drop your hemoglobin A1C by soaking regularly. That said, be careful if you're diabetic, you're also at more risk for infection. So public hot tubs need to be maintained really carefully. Um, you may want to get a dog also if you have diabetes. Uh, uh, first, we know that if you have a dog, you're much less likely to be sad or depressed. It also reduces the risk of dying. But it also shows that if you have diabetes, your dog is more likely to have diabetes. And if your dog has diabetes, you're more likely to have diabetes. So, you know, feed your dog in a, in a more healthy pattern uh, and stop giving them all these awful treats that are out there. Also, very important, I always talk about connectedness, love, and support. But believe it or not, there's enormous data over the years that has been published that shows how important this is. This is an interesting study from Japan. 7,800 spouses of patients that were admitted to the ICU for greater than two days. And those with a spouse in the ICU had an increased risk of a heart attack, chest pain, stroke, or regular heartbeat. And they also had a risk of being hospitalized themselves for heart disease up to a third more. People with a spouse in the ICU were more likely to be diagnosed with high blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol. So when you take care of each other and your dog, uh, better outcomes occur. And then we might be in trouble. This is interesting. If you're worried about Earth's future, and we all certainly should be, uh, the outlook is actually worse than even scientists can grasp. Essentially, humans have created an ecological Ponzi scheme. Consumption as a percentage of the Earth's capacity to regenerate itself has been grown from 73% in 1960 to more than 170% today. You may have seen this interesting slide that has been circulating a lot uh, in the internet here. How sustainable is your glass of milk? Um, oops, I don't have this. Uh, this isn't showing up right on this slide. I'll have to show you, but basically it shows that there's an enormous amount of water that goes into dairy. Sorry, this isn't projecting right on your side. I can see that. Uh, but you may have seen that there was some better news. Uh, so plant-based products are infiltrating fast food to meet customer demand. So you can get a plant lettuce and tomato, I suppose, but maybe uh, you should avoid uh, the cheese and the mayo that goes with it, uh, which still come from animals. I always find that so interesting when people get a uh, vegan burger with the cheese on it. Um, but Beyond Meat is actually going to launch a couple of new versions of its meatless bur uh, burger uh, that are healthy. So as you may know, this uh, Beyond Burger, the Impossible Burger, and a bunch of the others have so much saturated fat that it is not recommended by any health person. Uh, but they're going to make a burger that apparently will taste good and be healthy. We'll have to see uh, if that's the case. But I would tell you I'm still a big fan of those veggie burgers that Costco sells, those superfood burgers. Uh, easy to make. You don't have to do anything except heat them up. Uh, and they don't have any of the bad stuff, and you can see the vegetables and greens in it, so always a plus. For those of you who are not familiar, we do intensive cardiac rehab here based on the Ornish program. Our outcomes continue to be incredibly strong with marked reduction in cholesterol, body weight, blood pressure, etc. Highly encourage you to check one out if there's one near you. If not, encourage your doctors to set one up. It's a, a great way to take care of people. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is our stats from the end of 2019. You can see we dropped uh, body mass, cholesterol, triglycerides, blood pressure, hemoglobin A1C. We markedly improved depression and boosted exercise capacity, just to name a few. Um, beware of the junk that's out there, right? Always a great thing. I see people in the candy aisle always checking the labels, looking to see if there's gelatin or milk or whatever, but be careful. Junk food's not good for you. So in short, eat a whole food, low-fat, plant-based diet. Um, Remember that Albert Einstein said that nothing would benefit human health and increase our chances of survival on this planet as much as the evolution to a vegetarian diet. Uh, I also encourage you to check out a program. We do one called Walk with a Doc. We're actually restarting it this Saturday. If you find yourself in Denver on Saturday, come join us. Uh, but otherwise, they are all over the country, and uh, I'm sure there's one somewhere near you. But if not, encourage the docs that you know to set one up. We also have a transitioning a plant-based support group. Uh, it's now on Zoom, so you all can attend if you wanted to. Uh, it's similar to what you guys do here. Uh, and you can find it on the National Jewish website. Um, and it's run by a plant-based dietitian. Our former volunteers uh, just uh, changed. And then if you're not convinced, learn. Read, study, go out to eat, 
experience new things um, and get knowledgeable. It's really powerful. And with that, I've left time for questions. And it, unmute there. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. That is a ton of information. And we have a number of questions uh, or a number of people asking whether or not you might have a list of these studies or or a uh, uh, or a or a PowerPoint that might be available to uh, other people that you could send me that I could pass on. We, we yeah, do I, I'll send you this PowerPoint, and uh, you can you can distribute it. It's a, a large file, but every slide has a reference, um, so you guys can really examine the studies in great detail. I mean, I obviously didn't do most of these justice, right? I could probably spend the whole hour talking about one study. Um, but what I want you all to realize is this is just a small sampling. I didn't include every study I found. And this is just one year. So you can only imagine how much data out there. It, it's, it's incredible. So, so the uh, question would be, are there any studies that you've come across that show that there is a danger to eating too many vegetables or fruits or fiber? I have never found one. Uh, I guess there, you know, the one risk is if you were to eat, say, an enormous amount of carotenoid, like carrots, your skin might turn a little orange. To me, that's not really a risk, but if it, if it makes you worried, don't eat too many, I guess. I've actually never taken care of anyone who's achieved that. Um, and then the only other caution I would give you is if you are on dialysis and you eat loads and loads of fruits and vegetables, you could put yourself into a dangerous condition with too much potassium. But by and large, that's pretty much it. So let me let me jump into a few questions. There were uh, some that were, a couple that were sent uh, actually before the meeting. One, uh, and this is kind of a two-part, uh, uh, you know, somebody has a husband who uh, has uh, AFib, uh, can plant-based have an effect on that, plant-based nutrition? And, and in addition to that, uh, she says, my husband had AFib, but was able to return to a normal heart rate after going through an ablation procedure. He's still on el Eliquis, I think, Eliquis, a blood thinning drug. His doctor recommends staying on Eliquis are there side effects more harmful than not being on the drug? Yeah, so kind of a loaded question. So first, there are dietary effects on AFib, particularly with obesity. Um, so getting thinner and fitter actually will reduce the burden of AFib in many, but not all. And ablation does not actually get rid of AFib. It typically electrically isolates it. So a teeny tiny portion of the heart is actually still in AFib, believe it or not. Um, but there, but there, if it's isolated enough, the heart rhythm doctors sometimes will take people off of blood thinners, which I caution care uh, people about, because it actually uh, atrial fibrillation itself is associated with a higher risk of blood clots. So even when my AFib patients are on normal rhythm, where they've been put there by an ablation or a drug, I always keep them on a blood thinner unless they have a big risk of falling or something that would be catastrophic if they were on a blood thinner. So by and large, yes, diet can improve uh, outcomes in AFib. It, we don't have any studies showing that it cures AFib, and I would agree with staying on the eloquence if it's possible. Uh, another question here. My dad is 75 and has heart disease. He has eight stents, and I'm trying to get him to adapt better habits. His cardiologist has told him, quote, there is nothing he can do diet-wise, and it's all genetics, unquote. I just yes. he says. Yeah, I, I, I hear this all the time, and I would tell you that I, I'm going to guess that you're uh, dad's cardiologist is probably your dad's age. Um, and again, nothing to be ageist here, but there is a, a, a different demographic of doctors who never even heard of any of the stuff that I talked about today, uh, who unfortunately have, have decided that your genes are your fate. And what we know is that your genes are important, but they don't have to be your fate. We know from epigenetics, the folding of the proteins that your genes encode, that the environment you put your genes in is often what controls their expression. So how do you change the environment of your genes? Well, we don't know how to do that with drugs or techniques just yet, but you can change the food you eat, which is what your body's genes are exposed to every single day. So in short, I really hate when I hear that. Now, he may have a terrible genetic uh, you know, lineage and there may be not much that we can do, but many times, even in those folks, a plant-based diet can reduce the burden of disease to some degree. Uh, and for everybody else, changing your diet this way is a really, a powerful approach to reduce the likelihood of more stents and disease down the road. So I just, I hate when I hear it. It's like when a doctor says you should eat more red meat. And, and at the end of the question, she says he does eat less red meat, but but as a classic meat and potatoes guy and wondering what your suggestions would be as, as far as diet. 
Well, you got to ask him if he wants to eat to live or live to eat. But if he's had 75 years of meat, meat and potatoes, maybe it's time for a change, right? So you got to sometimes ask people, all right, uh, what if we could change your diet and it might prevent you from having a heart attack down the road or another stint? Uh, you know, the way I do it when I talk with my patients, particularly in that bracket is I say, hey, do you want to be, you know, grandpa, whoever, Joe, uh, you know, who's in a wheelchair, drooling to himself, feeling terrible because you've had a stroke, you can't walk and you're in chest pain, or do you want to be dancing at your great granddaughter's wedding? And for many people, that's the motivation they need to hear. So, you know, I always tell people there's always a, a hook to get somebody uh, to make changes in their lifestyle that are beneficial. But for a lot of people, you know, it's very hard, right? When I say to a 75 year old, I want you to stop eating what you've been eating for the last 75 years, most of them are ready to fire me on the spot. Uh, but when I tell them about the outcomes and when I work with them and hold their hand through the process, which is really the key with groups like this, this kind of a support group is so great to have. Um, you know, that's powerful and that really makes a difference. But more than anything, um, when I take a person like that and put them through intensive cardiac rehab, I say to them, look, I need you to suspend your disbelief for two months. Go to this program at twice a week for four hours and learn how to live. And if you're not feeling better at the end, I'll eat my hat. And they always feel better. They always do. And you haven't had to eat any hats yet, right? No, no, no. Thankfully, most of them are plant based. <laughs> um, there's a question here. Does cooking destroy the fiber? So if you've got a whole food with, uh, with fiber in it, I don't know what you pick yeah. up. So, you know, it is true that cooking can sometimes destroy some of the nutritional content of some foods. And in many foods, the fiber will soften or change. It doesn't usually destroy it, though. So I would recommend if you can to eat the, the foods however you like best. If you want to eat them raw, feel free. Some foods actually have more nutritional when you, when nutrition when you cook them, for instance, tomatoes. Uh, so you really have to decide what you're up for. Uh, but I don't have any strong suggestion. However you like it is good. Uh, there's a question. Please repeat the soy versus beer association again. So uh, a lot of people are worried about plant-based estrogens, right? That's why they won't consume soy. It turns out that plant-based estrogens occupy the same receptor sites as native estrogens. These are the estrogens that are in our body that regulate what we do when we get sick. So if a, a normal body estrogen goes in and kind of activates a cell and it fires it up, a plant-based estrogen will occupy that same spot, but not fire it up as much. Um, there used to be a concern that eating plant-based estrogens would fire it up even more, but that's turned out not to be close to true. But it's interesting, if you look, the most potent of all phyto or plant-based estrogen actually comes from a compound in beer. It's a very, very long chemical name abbreviated as 8PM. And when you eat it, your gut flora turns it into estrogens. So uh, you may see your favorite friend who drinks, you know, six pack a day. If they're a man, they may have sort of the man boobs, both from a combination of fat and estrogen, believe it or not. I'm just looking here for the next... Uh... Uh, can you tell us about the supplement berberine? I've read this can be as effective as metformin. What are your thoughts on this? Best nutrition advice to reverse diabetes? Yeah, so um, I would tell you that in general, I don't recommend or endorse really any supplement. And, and the data on berberine is certainly interesting as it is in cinnamon. You know, I, I, I've had patients who literally will eat a stick of cinnamon every morning, which I can't even imagine how to do that. Like, have you ever been into a cinnamon stick? It's not really a very pleasant thing. But anyway, um, I would say that in general, there's not enough data to recommend that approach. I would tell you that there is some very interesting data about diabetes, um, and it's twofold. One is um, Walter Kempner in the 1940s uh, did some very interesting work with diabetics where he fed them white rice and fruit. That's it, and sh basically sugar. And he had them walk all the time, all over Durham, North Carolina. And believe it or not, in the 1940s, he cured diabetes in 90% of them or more, which is unbelievable and unheard of with no drug, right? Just sugar. And that's because diabetes is really a disease of fat excess. And you get fatty deposits in the liver, you get fatty deposits in the muscle. And then when blood sugar is, cons when sugar is consumed and you have blood sugar, the receptors can't come up and suck up that blood sugar. So they stay in the bloodstream and your blood sugar is higher. So believe it or not, you may find it weird to feed a diabetic, you know, cotton candy or sugar. If you did that initially, their blood sugar would go through the roof, may be quite dangerous, so I don't recommend that. But if you did it enough, they may not actually have diabetes anymore. Now, there are some other theories out there. More uh, recently, there was some studies that were done out of Israel uh, where they fed people different foods and watched their sugar spikes. 
And it turns out that we may all be slightly different. And some people, when they eat sugary food, they do spike their sugar and some people don't. Uh, so we may be in an era that comes of personalized nutrition where, you know, in the plant-based world, we may not eat, say, you know, plant-based Ben and Jerry's very much, but we may eat potatoes. Maybe we eat beans and not potatoes or whatever it is. So there's a lot of emerging data out there. But again, if you eat well, you really don't need a supplement. Uh, as a vegan or vegetarian, how do you know if you need B12 or iron supplements? Do you just assume you do and take them? It's a great question. So what I always tell people is if you are a new plant-based eater, the likelihood of you being B12 deficient is quite low. Uh, but if you are not a new, uh, I usually recommend either checking it or taking a supplement once in a while. And then whenever possible, adding something called nutritional yeast to your popcorn or your food or whatever it is, because it's kind of a tasty, cheesy flavor, uh, but it contains naturally occurring B12. Um, and what I would say is, if that's not enough, you can certainly take a B12 supplement. You know, it's interesting if you go to Costco, wherever you go, you know, the little B12 pill you take is like, you know, 100,000% of what you need in one day. It's not absorbed very well. That's probably why. Um, but I would tell you, just be careful. You know, I, if I remember, I'll take one once a week. Um, but in general, if I can put nutritional yeast on popcorn, I'm, I'm a big fan. Oh, and in terms of iron, if you eat enough green leafy vegetables, you don't need iron. Um, I do recommend eating green leafy vegetables with both vinegar or lemon or both if you can. Uh, there's something about the vitamin C and the vinegar that seems to sort of activate some of that uh, iron absorption as well. Great. And uh, <clears throat> how do you suggest your clients beginning a plant-based diet for people who haven't done it? I, you know, I know that uh, you can come with a lot of information. You can tell them that this is something that they ought to do, but if but if it's not kind of laid out. Um, and if there's no follow-up. Yeah, so I think it's very irresponsible when doctors say to their patients, hey, you should eat plant-based, see you later, or eat better, right, or exercise, right? None of my patients ever come back and do that when, when I was doing that back when I was in training before I had any clue. Um, so in short, you know, I think um, knowledge is power. So I usually give my patients a whole slew of resources, recipes. I usually refer them to the, the PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM.org, uh, to the 21-Day Vegan Kickstart. There's even an app. I usually, for the people who say, well, doc, I can't cook, I'll recommend a meal service uh, or one of those like, you know, purple carrots or something like that. Um, and then I give them a bunch of documentaries to watch on Netflix uh, that really will get them inspired. Um, you know, Folks Over Knives and others, which most of you have probably seen. And then there are cookbooks that they can find. They can find them at their local library. Um, there's really no shortage of recipes and resources out there. And then we have that support group, which I mentioned. Things like this are really great. I encourage them to attend the veg fest in their, in their neck of the woods. Um, you know, I try to really just constantly reinforce. So every visit I have with a patient, I usually ask them what they had for dinner uh, or what they had for lunch to get a sample of what they're doing, how they're doing, monitor their progress. But I talk about lifestyle at every single visit. And I think that's a really important approach for all the doctors on the call, that incorporating lifestyle medicine into every visit is a way to A, pay the bills, right? Because everyone will say, oh, lifestyle medicine by itself is not uh, a way to stay in business. But I would tell you that you know, I take care of people's blood pressure or, you know, their shortness of breath or their heart failure. And every single visit, I also spend a few minutes on lifestyle. And I think that's a really effective way. Um, let's see. What, <clears throat> if anybody has any additional questions, don't hesitate to uh, put them in the chat box here. Um, can you think off the top of your head, Dr. Um, of a few uh, patient stories with, of course, without names, of uh, people who've come in, uh, maybe maybe especially people who were resistant. Um, so I would say that in general, most people are highly resistant unless they have been near death's door, right? So I always joke that I can get a patient who had bypass surgery to eat the tray that their lunch came on if I told them it was going to save their lives. Um, so it is um, for people who are um, motivated to uh, change, I usually assess their how open they are for change. Uh, and then I usually will talk to them about how to do this. And I think everybody is initially resistant, but it's interesting, even today, literally just before this call, um, I got a call from one of my pulmonary colleagues who saw this patient who was 70 something, uh, who had a variety of conditions, pulmonary hypertension, systemic hypertension, marked shortness of breath, obesity. Uh, he had some form of lung disease or something. Anyway, he went on, I, I, and he also had marked, marked coronary disease, and he was feeling terrible. So I put him through our intensive cardiac rehab program, which he was quite resistant to do. And now he's lost 30 pounds. He's off of many of his meds. 
and he feels the best he's felt in the last 25 years, right? And I have that story all the time. But most importantly, I love it when my colleagues call me up and say, you're not going to believe this, Freeman. Some crazy guy listened to you, and I can take him off his oxygen pump, or I can uh, take him off of his blood pressure pills or his prednisone or whatever it may be. I love those. Those are the best. I love when diabetes goes into remission. I love when heart failure normalizes. And these are, you know, it's not everybody gets this lucky, but a lot of people do. And I love those stories. It's the most rewarding thing that I do when I get a patient that literally has transformed their life and cured themselves effectively uh, of their diseases. It's great. Wow. Uh, can a plant-based, a few things popping up here. So uh, let's see, can a plant-based diet help reduce kidney stones? You know, it's interesting, kidney stones come from a variety of conditions, and overall, there has been some work suggesting that a plant-based diet makes kidney stones less likely. But remember that a lot of people make these oxalate kidney stones, which come from plants, typically things like chocolate and figs and all that. So sometimes kidney, uh, plants, uh, kidney stones can get worse. Uh, you know, the question is, and I don't think anyone's ever proven this, if you have kidney stones on a traditional American meat-based diet and then you switch to a plant-based diet, does that make kidney stone chances less? I suspect the answer is yes, but I, I don't think it's been proven. Uh, there's a question. Can you talk more about AS and cruciferous vegetables benefiting? AS. Uh, you mean the, the aortic stenosis? Yeah. Uh, Becky, do you want to uh, Maybe hop on and, and explain what AS is? Hi, uh, Doc, hi um, Dr. Freeman. You mentioned, I think, um, that when people were eating things like broccoli, they had less aortic sclerosis and stenosis, I believe. And as oh, yeah, normal. no, it was actually aortic calcification on that. Calcification. Okay, sorry, I, I went to the next step. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's an interesting, you know, remember that a lot of the same pathophysiology that makes atherosclerosis in blood vessels seems to be linked to at least degenerative aortic stenosis, which is a valvular condition. Um, you know, so it's, it's interesting. I see another question here about statins. Right. So I would tell you that, you know, it is a very loaded discussion when a patient says to me, well, I'm going plant-based, so I'm coming off my statin. What I tell people is there's never been a randomized controlled trial between a statin and a plant-based diet. So if someone says to me, well, doc, I had a heart attack. How do I lower my risk the most to the lowest possible? I tell them to live an incredibly good lifestyle and be on a statin. Now, some people will say to me, doc, my cholesterol is nearly zero as it is. It turns out that there's no cholesterol that's too low, uh, which we have reinforced with more recent data. So there are some people who will take an educated guess and say, you know what, doc, I'm going to take my chances and not be on the statin, but I appreciate what you're trying to tell me. But until we do such a study, we really have to stay on the statins for people who are at highest risk, you know, people who've had heart attacks, people who've had bypass surgery or stents. Um, and unfortunately, that's sort of um, where we are. It's a bit of a, a misnomer. There are people out there who think that if they go fully plant-based, they don't need a statin. Uh, and I would tell you, there's really no data to support that. And yes, vegans have heart attacks. Not as commonly, but they do. Uh, here's one that I find suggesting adding healthy foods first, rather than taking away some of their favorite unhealthy foods is much better received than telling someone to take out multiple foods they love. S small steps, achieve a small goal, more likely to be motivated to achieve, to achieve the next. Yeah, I'm going to guess that that person is a nutritionist. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So I would tell you that that it's a standard nutritional philosophy. And I would agree that many times some people can make small steps to get to a bigger goal. But I would tell you that human nature, unfortunately, doesn't always work that way, right? So if you look at the success of, say, the keto diet or the paleo diet or the Atkins diet, what happens? People do an all or nothing approach. Now, I'll say to a patient, look, you can do this stepwise if you like, or you can do this 100% and see what happens. Now, usually what I say to a patient is, okay, if you're going to do this and you're not willing because you're afraid you're going to miss what, some food, what food are you going to miss, right? And they almost always tell me it's cheese. So I say, okay, I have a couple options for you. One, you put a thin slice of avocado or whatever it is that you use to put cheese. And if that's not enough, you can find a plant-based cheese. And these days, they have artisanal cheeses made from every plant you could possibly imagine that are unbelievably decadent. They are not health foods, but if it helps you get to be plant-based, I'm all for it, so go for it. And believe it or not, like even like foods like you may know that that um, what is that stuff called? Borsan, the Rondelli cheese now is now plant based. Uh, you may have seen the Miyoko's brand. I mean, you know, cultured, artisanal, whatever. So if that's what it is, I tell people try that. Now, do I want them eating that all the time? No, but if, it, if it's a bridge, I'll take it. But I would say that yes, for some people, small steps do work. 
Um, but for a lot of people, they're just not wired that way. So, um, you know, again, see what works for each of your patients and then try that. Uh, was there something negative about seltzer? Um, there's really nothing negative per se about seltzers is carbonated um, water, which uh, has uh, a type of acid in it. So if you drink loads and loads and loads and loads of it, you know, there's a theory that it may have some effect on bone density. It's been controversial. I would say that and it also can also lead to reflux or, or other issues there. I guess what I would say is, you know, if you said to me you're going to drink seltzer instead of Diet Coke, I'm all for it. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, seltzer has come in and out over the years. You know, my parents grew up in the generation where they had to have seltzer delivered. I don't know if any of you had that. Um, and then now you can find a soda stream and have every seltzer you want. Now there's flavored seltzer, there's hard seltzer. So you like seltzers everywhere these days. So if that's what you need, feel free. Um, but I would say that, you know, if you don't need it, uh, you know, you don't need to, you know, use it as an occasion. Uh, there's a comment here. I believe green tea and spinach has more calcium ox oxalate and can worsen kidney stone risk in the with these. Yeah, that's true. As I mentioned before, um, plants are, are very high in oxalates, many of them, and can certainly worsen kidney stone risk. The question that hasn't been answered is if you if that's in it, and that's in all comers, right? But if you look at a, a more plant-based person who's eating, say, a potentially more acidic diet uh, and potentially more potassium and other things like that, is that still going to make oxalate stones? And, and nobody's really answered that, though there's some suggestions that it could potentially be less. Uh, and uh, someone mentioned I had to go 100% plant-based, couldn't do it little by little. And I personally would mention that's what I did, and it was much easier not having, if you're right. going to have a little cheese and a little meat and a little of this, you, you, you can't. I always tell people it's, it's exactly that, right? So again, some patients do it, and it looks like Katie is a PA, not a nutritionist. Okay. Um, so what I would tell you is first, big fan of nurse practitioners and PAs, uh, and, and you guys really have the time many times more than the docs to spend with patients on this stuff. But I would tell you that the truth is, uh, when you do little by little, I always equate that to sort of a gateway drug, right? If you only have a little bite of bacon, then the next step is a hot dog, the next step is a hamburger, and, you know, or I always have people with what I call the once in a while syndrome. Well, doc, I only have this once in a while. And then when you ask them, what'd you have for dinner this day, and this day, and this day, and this day, and this day, before long, every day has something that's an animal product. Right? I've had people tell me that they're 90% vegan, but they have cheese and dairy every meal. Well, that doesn't, that's not right. So we have to really be careful how we say what we say. But again, you have patients that will say, you know what, doc, I need to do this little by little. I'm going to write out a plan and I'm going to do it. Great. Support that. But by and large, most human beings that I know are certainly not my own. And personally, I think it's harder by going, uh, going little by little because your taste buds never really change. <clears throat> so you never begin to get the, the real, uh, subtle and delicate, wonderful flavors of the fruits and vegetables and legumes and things like that. That uh... Yeah, you know, I would tell you to this day, I'm always uh, floored by when I get a perfectly ripe, beautiful piece of broccoli, how sweet it is. You know, if you told me as a kid that broccoli was sweet, I would have laughed at you and said, I'm not eating that stuff. And now I love it. Um, you know, it's all about, you know, trying produce and, and getting it from different places and you know, growing it yourself, but boy, it's amazing what you, what, how good fruits and vegetables taste when you, uh, that's all you eat. Any thoughts on apple cider vinegar as uh, GERD management? So typically, if you consume vinegar by itself, it actually will make your GERD worse, right? I don't know if you've ever swallowed vinegar. It's really caustic. So I don't recommend that. If you told me that you're putting apple cider vinegar on your kale salad, feel free. In terms of effects on GERD, I don't know the answer that it's ever been proven one way or the other. But vinegar can definitely be caustic, so be careful. And last, uh, last question here uh, is is directed to both of us here, Terry and Dr. Freeman. Why did you go plant based, Dr. Freeman? Um, so I went plant based for a variety of reasons, but I will put it very simply. One of my great colleagues and friends and mentors, Kim Williams, said there are two types of cardiologists: those that are plant based and those who haven't read the data. So the the overall evidence is incredibly compelling. Right, you have to be completely putting your head in the sand if you're reporting this data. Personally, I did this because I got frustrated. I, I came out of fellowship, you know, and every good fellow, um, you know, is in training, is conforming to whatever it is that their doctors and teachers have taught them. Nobody taught me about any of this stuff. So when I threw drugs to people that year after year for the first few years in practice, nobody got better. I said, there's got to be something more to this. And I started reading about this and I was absolutely blown away at how little I knew about anything. And so when I spent the time to really learn, research, 
Uh, I was floored away and really energetic and impassioned about trying to make these changes in myself and then my patients. And at the time I came out of training, I was in Philly, definitely enjoyed, you know, regular uh, pretzels with cheese, hot pretzels with cheese and cheese steaks. Um, and uh, I was 30 pounds uh, heavier than I am now. Um, so I redid my life insurance physical after I did that. I got a rebate check in the mail. And then I was very, very hooked. Um, but for my patients, it's been incredibly inspiring to watch them get better uh, as a very powerful tool in my tool belt. And I'll just uh, add, my, my dad was an engineer, so I kind of was into how things work. I was on vacation. I had by accident read Dr. Dean Ornish book once and was just pulled into it. And I uh, was looking at YouTube on vacation and there was a Dr. Dean Ornish TED talk and that led to another talk and led to another. And by two o'clock in the morning, uh, after seeing doctor after doctor after doctor saying largely the same thing, I said, this is, you know, this, this is too clear not to at least give it a shot. And I gave it a shot. And as Dr. Freeman, I lost 30 pounds that I didn't, I didn't think I needed to lose. I was working out all the time. Um, and almost immediately started to feel better. I mean, the energy started to increase. And as time has gone on, the cumulative effect I've noticed cognitively uh, it, that I'm beginning to, you know, I'm at the age where you begin to forget things. You know, why did I come into this room? Why did I start a, start a, a conversation or, or, and then begin to forget where you were going? And that still can happen to me. I mean, se I'm 72 years old now. So a lot of my friends, that's happening regularly. <clears throat> but now, and I've just noticed it's the last few years now, if I wait 15, 20 seconds, it comes back. It didn't used to do that. Uh, so there are any number of different things that have happened, as well as the inflammation, you know, no, no inflammation in the joints um, and the cholesterol dropping and all these other great things. I mean, my blood work, my doctor keeps telling me, wow, you know, you're off the charts for some of your age. Uh, so I just, I just happened into it. And then once you get in there and you start to feel better, you don't want to go back. Um, Absolutely agree. So spot on. And, and thanks again for having me this evening. This was a really nice group and very engaged, my goodness. And I'll, I'll just see one. I think there was one last one here too. Can you tell us again why it's helpful to add vinegar to green leafy vegetables? Um, there's some data actually that vinegar in itself uh, seems to improve vascular health. Um, and again, I don't know about you, if something's very vinegary, I can't really tolerate it. So I usually reach for a balsamic vinegar as my dressing on my green leafy vegetables. And green leafy vegetables should really be part of your, your daily consumption. Well, Dr. Freeman, thank you so much. You, you covered a lot of ground. And I can't believe that uh, all of this research happened in the last year. Yeah, most of it. I mean, it's pretty incredible. Uh, and I would encourage you all, if you're interested, you can spend some time on Google, Google Scholar, and you'll find unbelievable amounts of work in this space. So there's still more pumping out, I imagine, uh, every week. For sure. Well, have a good uh, rest of your night. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for coming. And remember that uh, next our next meeting is going to be May 27th at 6 p.m. And we're going to have Dr. Greger for about a half an hour of Q&A, uh, along with uh, a number of other things. Thanks. You have a wonderful night.